Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Texas Military Forces Museum. I would like to welcome you to our first Living History program in the last year and a half. And boy, does it feel good to be back here. We uh, really appreciate you coming out to be part of our celebration of Memorial Day, or rather I should say our observance of Memorial Day weekend. We're going to do that today uh, by looking back at the story of the United States Army in the war in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War, in the 1960s into the very early 1970s. The Texas National Guard, in fact almost all of the National Guard, was not mobilized for the war in Vietnam. It remained in reserve to reinforce our armies in Europe should World War III break out. War in Vietnam was fought mostly by regular units. However, there were a lot of Texas Guardsmen who volunteered to go over into the regular army and serve in Vietnam. And after the war was over, there were a lot of Vietnam veterans who came and became members of the Texas National Guard. So this is very much part of our National Guard story. And we are going to try and tell that story today by talking to you about the uniforms, the equipment, the weapons, the vehicles, and the tactics that were used by the United States Army and Marine Corps in Vietnam and those of our North Vietnamese and Viet Cong opponent. More than three million Americans served in Southeast Asia during the years of the Vietnam War. More than two and a half million of those actually served within the confines of Vietnam itself. Of that number, almost 58,000 did not live through the experience. More than 47,000 were killed in action, and more than 10,000 died in accidents, disease, and other mishaps. Over 303,000 Americans were wounded during the Vietnam War. And of course, we did not fought, fight that war by ourselves. There were the armed forces of the Republic of South Vietnam. There were Australian troops there, New Zealand troops, South Korean troops, Filipino troops, and even some 40,000 Canadians who volunteered to join the United States Army to confront communist aggression in Southeast Asia. Until the war in Afghanistan, our conflict in Vietnam was the longest conflict in American history. So it is a very important piece of our military story. And of course, we are honored to have tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans who are still here, uh, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, members of our churches and our community organizations uh, who are the living embodiment of the service and sacrifice of the men and women who fought and served in Vietnam. And what I would like to do right now is I would ask that any members uh, of our audience who are Vietnam veterans, I would like you to stand up and let us recognize you. Do we have any Vietnam vets here today? Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a round of applause. So let's get down to basics to begin with. I am representing a captain in the United States Army circa 1968. As a captain, I would be in command of an infantry company. That company, in theory, consists of four platoons, three rifle platoons and one weapons platoon. Uh, the full strength is about 174 men, but in combat, units were very seldom full strength. In fact, they were generally far below full strength. A platoon was supposed to be 44 troops. Very often, it was around 20 or 25 men. So what you see here behind me would be a typical platoon in combat action the war, during the war in Vietnam. Instead of three squads, it would be broken into two squads to concentrate its firepower. The platoon would be commanded by a lieutenant, and be assisted by a sergeant and two squad leaders. The uniform that we are wearing are called jungle fatigues. These are basically takeoffs of the the marine. Uh, I'm sorry, the uniform that paratroopers wore. Uh, during World War II. It's made of a lightweight poplin. It's very comfortable to wear. It's loose fitting. It dries very quickly when it gets wet. Uh, and uh, it's about as good as uniform as you can imagine having uh, in the jungles of Southeast Asia, where it was very hot and it was very humid. So if you like the heat and humidity that we have here today, we'll take credit for that. We requisitioned it months ago 
that we have something like familiar conditions, but in Vietnam it would be far hotter than what it is here, and it would be much, much more humid. So lightweight, loose-fitting clothing is what you want. Uh, as the war progressed, we moved to a ripstop fabric uh, that would be more difficult to tear in the jungle, easier uh, to sew up if you did uh, rip the uniform. Uh, the boots that I'm wearing are known as jungle boots. Uh, these are, of course, uh, kind of standard combat boot. They have a rubber sole. Uh, they have a high top that goes over the ankle, so it gives your ankle a lot of support. But one interesting thing about these is that they also have steel plates in the heel uh, to protect you from punchy pits. Uh, so the enemy like to make booby traps. Booby traps inflicted 7 to 11 percent of American casualties in Vietnam. So the Viet Cong like to dig a pit and then they'd take a board and they would stick sharpened bamboo up through that board. They would put that in the hole, they would cover it with some grass or some leaves. The idea was that you would step on it and your foot would go down and it would impale itself on those punji stakes. And sometimes those, were dick, uh, those punji stakes were dipped in human or animal excrement so that they would inflict a very nasty infection. And the steel plate in the jungle boot was designed to protect your foot uh, if that happened. Uh, so as long as your foot went straight down, you were good. If it twisted, well, you know, all, the, the, all bets are off. Uh, but again, the adaptation of the uniform to the realities of the war in Vietnam. The equipment that we're wearing is the model 1956 LBE load-bearing equipment. It consists of our ammo pouches, uh, what's called a butt pack in which we would carry our rations. Uh, very often we would have our poncho tied to it. Uh, and then typically you carry at least two canteens. If you can figure out a way to carry more and you're willing to pack the weight, you'll carry more because staying hydrated in those kinds of conditions was all important. Uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke were as much a danger to you out in the bush as the enemy was uh, on occasion. A lot of soldiers would also wear a towel around their neck because you were sweating all the time profusely. And so, you know, you could wipe that. This is also could be used to clean your weapon. Uh, you got muck or mud on it or something like that. It would help allow uh, a little bit of there. And then we're all going to wear the good old M1 steel helmet. This is the same helmet the GIs wore in World War II. They wore in Korea. We would, in fact, wear them all through the 1980s. Uh, but this has what's called a Mitchell pattern, a leaf pattern camouflage helmet cover on it to sort of give you a little bit of concealment uh, when you're out in the bush. So what you see here behind me is, as I said, a typical mid-war infantry platoon broken into two squads. Let's talk about the weapons these American soldiers are going to carry. The first weapon that we're going to discuss is the M14 rifle. Now, this rifle entered service in 1960. Uh, it was supposed to be the replacement for the M1 Garand, the Thompson submachine gun, and the 30 caliber, or, I'm sorry, the, the, the BAR, the 30-06 BAR. And so if you look at this weapon, it sort of looks like a Garand, if you're familiar with that, but it loads a 20-round box magazine like the BAR does. So you have the same ammunition capacity as the BAR. You have a weapon that operates basically like the Garand, except that this can be fired in a semi-automatic or a full automatic load. And then like your World War II weapons, which were 30-06, these are 308 rounds, or 7.62 millimeter. That's a very good round, has an effective range of about 500 yards, but one of the best things about it, it has great penetrative power. So when you're in dense woods or jungle, that bullet is going to go a long way. It's not going to be deflected by all that foliage and all that wood and stuff that's out there. Uh, it's going to be able to go down range and still hurt uh, the enemy. Now, this weapon has some serious drawbacks, though, for service in Vietnam. First off, it's very heavy. It weighs nine and a half pounds unloaded. Put the 20-run man, uh, magazine in there, it weighs 11 pounds. It's a very heavy weapon to carry through dense jungle and underbrush. Another problem with this is the wood stock. In, the, in the, that tropical climate, the wood tended to swell up, and that caused all sorts of problems for the M14 uh, rifle. And, and it was long. It's a rather long weapon. And trying to move through the jungle, the underbrush with that weapon, uh, wasn't really a very easy thing uh, to do. 
So interestingly, this weapon is pretty much gone from Vietnam by 1967. Only the first couple of Army divisions and the first couple of Marine divisions that deployed to Vietnam in 1965 and 1966 actually carried the M14. Uh, so the Army realized pretty quickly uh, that this wasn't going to work in Vietnam. In fact, it had decided well before we made our major deployments to Vietnam in 1965 that this weapon really wasn't going to do what the Army wanted it to do. It wasn't going to replace three different weapon systems, and so they began to design a replacement <coughs> for it. Uh, the uh, National Guard was never issued M14s. The National Guard would go straight from the M1 Garand to the M16 rifle. And although these were gone from Vietnam by 1967, the Army in Europe continued to carry it uh, for several years uh, after that. So we're going to show you what the M14 looks like in operation. Gentlemen, demonstrate your weapon. Now we are firing those on the semi-automatic mode and there's a reason for that. Although this theoretically could fire full auto and had a cyclic rate of fire at 600 rounds per minute, which means if you could ignore all the laws of physics, you didn't have to worry about overheating the weapon and you never had to reload it, in theory, the mechanism would put 600 rounds down range every 60 seconds. Now, in the real world, of course, you can't ignore the laws of physics. You have to worry about overheating your weapon and you have to reload. Uh, but as a full auto weapon, this round was too powerful for the weight of the weapon. You could not control an M14 at full automatic. Uh, so that sort of destroys the whole purpose of the M14 in the first place. So the M14 was there, but we very quickly got rid of it. Uh, and we went to the weapon that replaced it, which is the weapon I am carrying here. And this is the M16 rifle. It was developed as the AR-15, a semi-automatic rifle by the Army in the early 1960s. Uh, and it did pretty well in the trials. This thing only weighs about seven pounds, so it's much lighter. You'll notice that it's much shorter. Uh, it has a plastic hand grip and buttstock, so there's no wood to swell up here. Uh, and so this is a much better weapon to carry in a jungle. Because the weapon is lighter, they can issue you more ammunition. So you never carry less. If the Army finds a way to reduce the weight of something, that means that they can just add more weight to you someplace else. But more ammunition, of course, in combat is a very good thing. This weapon was adopted in 1963. They deployed it to Vietnam starting in 1966. And they deployed it too quickly. It didn't go through all the teething problems. The Department of Defense decided to mess with the powder charge, which threw all of uh, the balance of the weapon off. And so when they sent these to the troops in Vietnam at first, as the pure M16, the men didn't know how to clean them. And the Army said, oh, it's a wonder weapon. You don't need to clean it. There is no such thing as a weapon that does not need to be cleaned, especially in combat conditions. Uh, the men didn't know how to take care of the weapon. They had messed with the round, so there were a lot of jams. There was, at that point, no forward assist uh, to help load a round that had, uh, had jammed. And so there were a lot of problems with this early on. Uh, but the Army very quickly figured those problems out. It fixed them, came up with the M16A1, which is what you see here. And that was actually a very good weapon. It became reliable, lightweight, carried lots of ammunition, has an effective range of about 600 yards, loads a 20-round magazine, but we later went to a 30-round magazine. <clears throat> so as much ammunition as the M14 and then more ammunition loaded at a time as the M14. And as a fully automatic weapon, uh, this one was controllable. The one problem is the 5.56 millimeter cartridge doesn't have a lot of penetrative power. Though it can inflict a devastating wound, you don't want to get shot with this thing, but it had a hard time getting uh, that bullet through thick jungle and underbrush. The, the bullet could easily be deflected by tree branches uh, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, you're going to miss your target. You're going to hit your target uh, with the maximum power uh, that you were hoping uh, to hit it. Nonetheless, this becomes the standard 
weapon of the United States Army is also what the South Vietnamese forces are going to carry uh, through most of the war. It's what we're going to carry all the way uh, until we get to the war on terror, uh, when we begin to move away from the M16 to the M4. And I'll show you what this thing looks like in operation. That's 20 rounds, just like that. To an infantryman, being able to shoot that fast sometimes feels really reassuring, but in combat, it's a really bad idea. Unless you've got an obvious target that needs that much, that quickly, you don't want to shoot that fast because if you shoot that fast, in about two minutes, all the ammo that I've carried is gone, and then I'm in real trouble. But one of the things they did with this later is they put a selector switch on here so that you could fire three round burst. So you could have a little kind of semblance of automatic firepower, uh, but you weren't going to waste your ammunition quite as quickly. So the M16 is the standard rifle that's going to be carried by the American soldier through most of the war in Vietnam. But of course the squad, the platoon, has more weaponry than that. And one of the primary weapons of the squad is the one that we're going to bring out now, the M60 machine gun. So you want to talk about the real firepower of an infantry squad or an infantry platoon is the M60, which is sort of a lot like the German MG42 from World War II. In fact, it's something of a copy of it. It weighs 24 pounds. <clears throat> so that is a very heavy weapon to carry on patrol in the jungle. And there's a reason that the GIs called it the pig, uh, because it was like a big piece of pig iron, great big heavy thing. But it fires a 7.62 caliber round uh, at an effective range of about 1,200 yards. Remember that 7.62 is going to penetrate a lot of jungle, so you're really going to get that range out of it. You carry the ammunition in 100 round belts, and you see that they've got this ammunition draped around them. A lot of the other squad members would carry that ammunition as well because you wanted as much ammo uh, for the pig as you possibly can. You had to take care of this thing. You had to constantly clean it and oil it and baby it to make sure that it worked right. So just about any time a squad or a platoon would stop someplace for any length of time, the M60 gunner is going to be cleaning his weapon. And if he's not cleaning his weapon, the guys in the squad and the platoon are going to ask him why he's not cleaning the weapon. Because they want that thing to work right in combat. These were not only carried by infantry squads, they were mounted on our armored vehicles, they were also placed into helicopters. Uh, and so this was a weapon that was quite ubiquitous uh, amongst all the elements of the United States Army and Marine Corps uh, during the war in Vietnam. Uh, this has a cyclic rate of fire of about 750 rounds a minute, but remember, a cyclic rate of fire is theoretical, it really doesn't mean anything. A sustained rate of fire of this thing is about 200 rounds per minute. You fire short five, six, seven second burst, you can fire longer in an emergency, but you're going to go a little bit slower. You don't want to overheat that barrel, you don't want to have to change the barrel too often, you don't want to run through your ammunition uh, too quickly. So we're going to let you see what the M60s look like in operation. And the best way to fire it is on your belly, because when the enemy's shooting at you, which weapon system do you think he wants to take out first? Yeah, the guy with the machine gun, right? Ready? Demonstrate your weapons. Hey, you see that has a nice bark, but you still get that rat-a-tat-tat -tat sound that's so familiar with American weapons in World War II and Korea, and it continues on into the Vietnam uh, era. So that is the M60 machine gun. We have one other weapon in the rifle platoon, the rifle squad, that is extremely useful to the American soldier in combat, and that's the one we're bringing out now, the M79 grenade launcher. This thing is affectionately called the thumper. The thumper, because when you shoot it, it makes sort of a hollow thumping sound. It doesn't even really sound like you're firing a weapon. It's very quiet. But this is a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. It is a uh, breech-loading firearm. So you break open 
the barrel, put the round in, you close it, you're ready to shoot. Your typical thumper gunner carried a 45 pistol as his personal protection. Uh, he didn't carry a rifle because he's going to have about 40, uh, 20, 30, 40 of those uh, 40 millimeter grenades uh, on his person. So he's carrying a lot of weight here. Uh, this thing has an effective range of about 250 yards. Uh, you can fire high explosive, you can fire smoke, you can fire illumination, and in an emergency you can fire a flechette round, which is basically an anti-personnel round uh, that turns this thing into something uh, of a shotgun. It has a very elaborate iron sight on it. Uh, a good experienced gunner never used it. He didn't have to. He learned pretty quickly what angle he needed to hold that weapon in order to drop that round exactly where he wanted to send it. Uh, so this is another weapon that was very useful to the American soldier, and we're going to demonstrate this one for you as well. So it went down range quite a bit, right? <laughs> Notice how quiet that was? Compared to everything else we've shot, you're like, oh, somebody's shooting. That sounds like somebody, you know, fell down the stairs. Uh, so Thumper is a pretty accurate, that is what it sounds like. And uh, that uh, was the weapon that sort of replaces the 60 millimeter mortar uh, in the American Rifle Company uh, during the Vietnam War. Lightweight, easily carried, very simple operation, very easy to keep clean. And so that was one of the mainstays of the rifle squad. So those are the weapons that are carried in the typical uh, unit, both Army and Marine. And now we're going to focus in on some of the, uh, the more specialized stuff. Left face. Combat in Vietnam was usually at close quarters, and very often it happened by surprise. Now, the fact that a weapon could shoot five or 600 or 1,200 yards usually didn't matter. The enemy was a lot closer than that. Most of your infantry combat is going to take place at two or 300 yards maximum, and very often it's going to take place a lot closer than that. And when you're that close, different types of weapons become important. Uh, more important sometimes than even your rifle or your machine gun. And one of the weapon systems that the GI is going to rely on in Vietnam is one of them they relied on in World War II as well, and that is the hand grenade. Now, the hand grenades we carried in Vietnam are both similar and different than the hand grenades that we carried in World War II. They're still a fragmentation grenade, so the idea is that this iron shell is going to burst into dozens or more pieces and fling out as shrapnel to kill or maim the enemy. One of the great differences, though, is that the shape. So if you think of a World War II grenade, you remember it sort of looks like a pineapple. It's got all those squares on the outside of it. And what was supposed to happen is when the thing exploded, each one of those squares was supposed to become a piece of shrapnel flying through the air at flesh-ripping, man-killing velocity, right? Well, the problem was that it usually didn't work exactly like that. Now, you had the squares so that there were pieces of the shell that were weaker than the other. That's where the fragmentation is supposed to happen. But of course, the powder charge is on the inside, and if the inside of the grenade is smooth, then the explosive force meets a smooth surface, and you don't quite get the fragmentation you want. So what we do in Vietnam is we reverse that. We turn this grenade inside out. So all the scoring is on the inside, not on the outside, okay? And that means that when the explosion happens, you, the explosive force finds the weak spots a lot easier, you get better fragmentation. So this is often known as the baseball or the lemon grenade. Uh, it's much easier to throw than the World War II fragmentation grenade, but it works in exactly the same way. So to use this thing, the soldier of the Marine would grab this spoon in the palm of his hand and hold tight. That spoon is spring-loaded. Once he's got a good grip on that spoon, he bends the cotter pin that is connected to the safety ring. The safety ring stretches through the head and the spoon of the grenade, right? 
How many of you watched John Wayne, Chuck Norris, or Arnold Schwarzenegger pull that ring out with his teeth and throw this thing 300 yards and blow the enemy out of a tree in a small atomic explosion? Yeah, we've all seen that movie, haven't we? But that's not the way it works in real life. That cotter pin is bent on the other side. It doesn't come out easily. You don't want this to come out easily. It's your safety device. If it came out easily like John Wayne's grenade, I've got this on my gear, we're walking through the jungle, a vine catches that ring, pulls out the pin, this drops between my legs. Five seconds later, I get what's called the, the, the negative entry in my health record. So you want to keep that pin in place. So not until you need it. You keep the spoon good in the palm of your hand, bend the pin, put your finger in the ring and pull the cotter pin out. Now the only thing that holds this spring-loaded spoon in place is the pressure of your hand. When that pressure is released, the spoon jumps off the grenade, strikes an igniter that lights a five-second fuse. And five seconds later, this thing is going to blow up. And there's nothing in the world that you can do to stop it. you got five seconds, but you hold it for three seconds before you throw it. You count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, because if you throw this thing right away, the enemy will have time to pick it up and throw it back at you. So the whole time you're standing there holding this lit and sputtering grenade, you're hoping and praying like crazy that the person who worked in that defense plant back in the States three months ago really cuts you a five and not a four or a three second fuse. If everything works right, after three seconds, you lob the grenade. You use your left arm as an aiming point and you throw this thing like a shot put. You don't throw this like a baseball. Average GI, or grunt as we call them in Vietnam, can lob this thing about 30 yards. It has a blast radius of 25 yards. So you throw it and duck. It can be as dangerous to you as it is to your opponent. If you're fighting in the woods or the jungle, you don't even lob it. Pitch it underhand like a softball. Try any other method and I promise you, if there's one significant sized tree within 20 yards of you, you'll manage to find it and this will hit it and it will come bouncing back in your direction. So this thing isn't going to blow the turret off a tank, it's not going to knock down a building, but it's going to do a very good job on an enemy who's in a spider hole on the other side of a berm, in a shell hole, a fox hole or something like that. And we're going to just let you see what a Mark 26 grenade looks like in action. Demonstrate your weapon. No fireball, no mushroom cloud, but the enemy soldier who was where that thing landed is no longer a threat. And of course, that's what you're after. So the Mark 26 fragmentation grenade, one of the key tools for the American soldier in Vietnam. Now let's talk about another particularly lethal weapon, and one that gained a lot of notoriety and fame in the war in Vietnam, and that is the M19 Claymore anti-personnel mine. So every night, you dug in, you form a perimeter, you wait for the enemy to come to you. And the enemy liked to come at us at night if he was going to come at us at all. And so here's where the Claymore mine can be particularly useful to you. This thing only weighs about three and a half pounds. Half of that weight is plastic explosive. And embedded in that plastic explosive, inside that fiberglass container, are 704 ball bearings electrically detonated anti-personnel mine that throws those small bearings on a 60 degree arc out in front of your position to an effective range of between 25 and 250 yards. In the Civil War, this is what artillery was used to do to infantry. Canister is what it was called then. But this is an exceptionally deadly weapon. And so to deploy it, what the soldier would do is he would take the four prongs that bend out from under it, he would deploy those. He would take this to the position where he wants to defend. He would stick that in the ground. Then he would take out of the Claymore bag a wire, long length of electrical wire. He would place a detonator into the mine itself. You had to be very careful. Sometimes you booby trap these things because the enemy would occasion slip up at night. The VC was very, very quiet and stealthy, and he would turn them around facing you. And then he would pretend to stage an attack, and you would fire those mines, and they would shoot in your direction. 
So once the detonator's in, the soldier's going to take this spool of wire. He's going to run it back to his firing position. We're not going to go as far away as you would in real action, of course. Then he's going to plug the wire into what's called the clacker. That's the detonator. It's a simple device. Uh, it, it produces a spark of electricity that will send a charge through that wire to detonate the mine. So once he's got it connected, little clacker, he's got to clack it three times. One, two, three, and on the third clack, the mine is going to go off. Demonstrate your weapon. One, two, three! And that just sent 704 ball bearings in the direction of the enemy. And anyone that's in front of that is going to be shredded. There's not going to be very much of them to pick up when it is over. And that is the whole point of this weapon. So the Claymore Mine was another key piece of equipment for the American soldier in Vietnam. So, M14, M16, M60, M79, grenades, Claymores, they're all very effective. But the real killing power, the real killing power, is right here. That PRC 25 or 77 radio weighs 24 pounds. Battery will last for a full day if we don't use it too much. It has an effective range of five miles. But why does this matter? Because that allows a captain or lieutenant to talk to the air, the helicopters and the fast movers overhead, to talk to the artillery miles behind us and to call down the thunder of God on our opponent. What the American soldier believes in is why send a man where you can send a bomb, a rocket, or a shell. And this radio makes that possible. So my RTO, my radio telephone operator, is always going to be right by my side, and we get into trouble as quickly as possible. I'm going to be asking for support, artillery support, mortar support, reinforcements, this is how I'm going to summon in medical evacuation for my wounded, but it's time to get resupplied. This is how we're going to talk to the choppers or the trucks that are going to bring us that resupply. And if we're in trouble, it's the artillery in the air that come to us through this thing. There is one downside to all of that. Who do you think the enemy wants to shoot first? Right there. That's the first target. That's the first guy he wants to knock down. Because if he knocks out that radio, then we're on our own. So the life expectancy of an RTO wasn't necessary very long. You see how this antenna is up here like this? That's how he's going to go in the bush. He doesn't want to have that antenna up there until he has to have it up there because if the enemy can see that antenna, they know there's target number one. Oh, and if he's target number one, who's target number two? Me, right? knock out the communications, knock out command, take out the machine guns, and the enemy has a much better chance of prevailing. So this is a guy we've got to take care of. Notice he wears smoke grenades, colored smoke, because if you're calling in an artillery strike, and especially if you're asking for air support or a medevac, that smoke is going to tell those guys up in the air, this is where we are, this is where we need you uh, to be. So that's the basics of the American infantry platoon in Vietnam. But of course, we're not the only people there. We have an enemy, and that's who we're going to talk about next. Behind me is one half of the standard North Vietnamese Army VC Sapper organization. The other half of our organization may be hidden more closely than you know. The Sapper organization was the primary attack element for the NVA and the VC. The Sapper organization was broken into two teams. Team one had three cells of four to five men each. The first cell was the penetration cell. Their job penetrate the enemy line, break a hole so that the other two squads, the assault cells, could break through, causing death and destruction. The second team was exactly like the first, with the addition of a fire support cell. The fire support cell's responsibility was to pin the enemy down 
with cover fire so the assault cells could move more quickly, more freely. The, uh, the, that cell would break into two units and they would fire from different directions. They did this for two reasons. One, to make it harder to tell where the attack was coming from so the GIs could not set up a good perimeter. And two, to create a deadly crossfire. Now the attack cells usually had two goals in mind. One, push the enemy into a field that had been booby-trapped and mined. Or two, lure them into a chase where they would go into an area with heavy fortifications, mines, and booby traps. Again, causing more death and devastation. Now, the, the VC and the NVA used a mix of conventional war tactics and guerrilla war tactics. The guerrilla war tactic that most everybody was familiar with was the ambush. In an ambush, the VC would use a slow pattern of a one slow, four quick, meaning they would do slow reconnaissance to see what the enemy was, where they were, and then they would do a quick approach, quick assault, quick penetration, and then quickly clear and withdrawal. Now the VC planned their withdrawals with the same care that they planned their assaults. Again, their goal was to pull and lure that enemy into a fight that they didn't want to have. Now, again, pushing them into an area that's mined, booby trap, getting them to chase. One of the things about the VC and the NVA is we did not have the firepower of our enemy. As Captain Hunt mentioned, they had air force, they had artillery. We did not have that. So our goal was to hug the enemy, meaning fight as close to them as possible to make it harder for that Captain Hunt to call in that artillery because he didn't want to kill his own men. The VC and the NVA, despite common wisdom, were very well supplied, had very good supply lines, and had very good weapons. The two primary weapons they used were the SKS-45 carbine. The SKS fired a 7.62 millimeter round, had an effective range of about 440 yards. It weighs a little over eight pounds. It's a semi-automatic weapon and it had a 30 round magazine. It could fire anywhere from 30 to 60 rounds per minute in the hand of a good soldier. Like the weapons on the US side that Captain Hunt talked about, you can see the wood stock on these. They also had problems in the woods uh, and in the humidity and were not as reliable. So they switched to the AK-47. The AK-47 was, all of these weapons were created by communist China, Warsaw Pact, communist countries, and all. They had very good supply lines. The AK-47, by the end of the war, virtually all NVA and VC were carrying an AK-47. The AK-47 had some really significant advantages over the SKS. First of all, it was a little bit less than eight pounds. It was fed with a 30 round or a 40 round magazine, and it could fire semi-automatically 60 to 80 rounds per minute but it also had a full automatic trick push button. At full automatic, it could fire anywhere from 120 to 200 rounds per minute. That's really important when I'm hugging my enemy. The effective range was less than 400 yards. But again, if I'm fighting 15, 20 yards, it's about how much lead I can put down field, not how far I can shoot. The AK-47s, as I mentioned, by the end of the war were virtually the, the weapon that everybody carried in the NVA and the VC. Uh, it also came with a 75 round or a 100 round drum magazine. And if I'm carrying a 100 round drum magazine, now I can fire about 300 rounds per minute if I'm quick at getting it reloaded. Very effective weapon, very effective in close combat where we spent most of our time. The final weapon we're going to talk about is early in the war, uh, we just had our small arms. But as you saw, our enemy pull up in heavily armored vehicles. These weapons do nothing against that. So we, toward the middle of the war, brought in the rocket-powered grenade. The RPG weighed about 15 pounds. It fired a five-round rocket. The rocket would go about seven and a half miles per hour. Uh, but it could do great damage when it hit one of those, ar those armored vehicles in the right spot. It had a range of about 500 meters. At 500 meters, 30% of the time you were accurate. At about 300 meters, 80% of the time, you are accurate. But again, our goal is to fight as close as we want to. So we want to be 20, 30, 40 yards away to have the most accuracy with our RPGs, the most accuracy 
with our small arms weapons, and we have on our side Surprise. The uniforms they are wearing, very lightweight, very easy to camouflage. How many of you saw them hiding in the woods behind us? Not many. Very easy, lightweight. The other thing that was an advantage to us was that outfit uniform looks a lot like the civilians are wearing. Now the GI has to make a decision. Am I shooting a bad guy or am I shooting a good guy? So surprise was one of our key elements. We worked hard on that. The teams moved very quickly, very easily, and caused great damage. So we think of the war in Vietnam as an infantryman's war in dense jungle, but in fact there was a great deal of variety in the climate and the terrain of Vietnam. The war was very different depending on where you were in the country and when you were in the country. You had mountains in the highlands, you had swamps uh, in the Mekong Delta, you had uh, rubber tree forests that were like fighting through a, a well manicured uh, you know, lawn uh, somewhere in, in Europe. Uh, and it wasn't just infantry that was there, we had armor in Vietnam as well. The M48 tank was the main tank that we used, and the M113 armored personnel carrier was the primary light armored vehicle that was employed in Vietnam. So what you see here to my left is an M113 armored personnel carrier. This is a vehicle that was designed to transport infantry across the battlefield and give it some protection from small arms, machine gun fire, and artillery shrapnel. Uh, it is uh, a 25,000 ton or pound vehicle. Uh, it is eight feet, three inches tall. It's about 16 feet long. It has a two-man crew and can carry 11 infantrymen inside. So it's basically a hollow box. It has a ramp that you saw lowered so that the infantry can come out very quickly. When the infantry exits, they'll go left and right. They don't all go in one direction because that way, if there's a machine gun on that side and everybody goes out to the left, everybody goes out to the left gets hit. If you send half out to the left and half out to the right, then maybe only half your guys get hit and the others are still able to get into action. Uh, this thing has a top speed of 40 miles per hour, so it can haul across the battlefield very quickly. Uh, armor, though, well, 1.7 inches maximum of aluminum armor. Uh, so anything bigger than a 50 caliber machine gun is going to go through this thing. The aluminum armor means it's fast. It does protect you against most small arms and some artillery shrapnel, but then any tank weapon is going to knock this thing out. Now, in the beginning, when we started to deploy these to Vietnam, the enemy didn't have those anti-tank weapons, but when things like those RPGs showed up, suddenly he had the ability to penetrate the armor. Uh, the men who operated uh, armored personnel carriers like this, however, learned a secret. When they would go into logger at night, they would form a perimeter facing out toward the enemy. They carried length uh, of chain link fence, rolls of chain link fence, and they would go out a few yards front and they would install that chain link fence in front of them. And when the RPG comes in, as soon as it hits that fence, it explodes. So it never gets close enough to penetrate the armor. The great danger to these things was landmines. And the enemy had lots of landmines. Uh, and a landmine might not destroy the vehicle, but it would knock the vehicle out and potentially cause some casualties. And you'll notice that when we came in, one of the tracks, most of the guys were riding on top, because if you were inside and you hit a landmine, everybody inside is going to get hurt or going to get killed. If you're on the outside, then the chances are that you're going to survive. And also, you can get into combat quicker if you jump down, then you wait for that ramp to be lowered and to, to come out that way. Of course, being up top also means you're, you're losing all the protection of that arm. Uh, what we would do is we would put 50 caliber and M60 machine guns on these things. They were very formidable. The enemy usually didn't want to mess with these in, in straight up uh, combat. 
So these were really good in some of the open terrain around Saigon. It was really good in, uh, in helping to get convoys down the roads to their destinations. Uh, we made about 80,000 M113s and about 2,000 of them served uh, in Vietnam. about the 113 series of vehicles is they were very versatile. They're like the half track in World War II. You can use them and their intended purpose, which is as an armored personnel carrier, but they can also be fire support vehicles. And so this is what is known as an M106. This is a, a weapons variant of the 113. And you'll notice that the top opens up and it does that because what's inside of this is not seating for an 11 man rifle squad, but a 4.2 inch mortar. Uh, that mortar, if we were going to carry it, all of its parts and pieces weighs more than 175 pounds. It's not something you're going to hump through the bush, but you put it in a vehicle that'll go 40 miles per hour, you can take that mortar almost any place you want to go. A mortar crew can get about 12 rounds a minute sustainable fire out of this track uh, to an effective range of almost 5,000 yards. So this was a way to very quickly move fire support uh, up to the infantry. If the air wasn't available, if we couldn't get artillery, this was going to be the substitute. So we're going to let you see this mortar in operation. And a fire from there, look down at the tree on the far end of the bleachers. Demonstrate your weapon. The actual explosion would be a little bit meaner than that, but we're close to 35th Street, so. And so this is another one of the Grunt's friends up on the front lines. There wasn't a lot of this out there, and it was only in certain parts of the country, but if you were operating in the regions where this kind of a vehicle could maneuver and be very effective, this is something that was going to convince the enemy to stay very, very far uh, away from you. And so uh, as much firepower as you can get up there on the front lines, uh, the better. So this is the M106. Let's put it together. Let's see what this stuff really looks like in action. 